Green. Uh, I am actually a retailer just like you. I have three hardware stores in Michigan. Uh, like you, I've been up against the depots and the Lowe's and in the Midwest we deal with Menards. So when I talk to you and I stand in front of you, I talk from a little different angle than a lot of people that you maybe get to see at different training seminars. And that I'm a retailer first. My software business that's kind of grown out of uh, my own personal need is kind of a, a secondary thing for me. One of the things I enjoy tremendously is getting to come to, to markets and, and get in front of other retailers and have that direct discussion about what's going on and you know doing a conversion and we've got our classes and how are we going to get those to be listening. That's cool stuff. I've been I've been a retailer for 22 years. Uh, I took over my dad's store that he had for, in 1977. That store was closely related to my family since the late 1800s. So I've got a little bit of hardware in my blood. But one of the things that happened about 10, actually 10 years ago, this spring in fact, uh, was pricing became, I was, I was awakened to the need for a fo refocus on pricing in our store. And what brought that about was I was looking at the time and taking over my dad's business, and I was thinking to myself, why the heck would I do this? Because I can't make enough money doing this to, to justify the paying the bank or to pay him off for sure. He wasn't walking away for nothing. So when I started to figure out what I was going to do, pricing was one of the things that became a very key piece to me. And Margin Master was founded back then, and the idea of managing pricing with some type of logic was really unheard of. And, and there, were, there were systems, there were things in place where you could set a margin or you could do some clever things, but there was no real tool to let you really do any forecasting or see what's going on. My background in school was computer science, so that was a natural fit for me in the hardware store. So just, just so I have a little bit of feel for who's in the room today, how many of you have Margin Master today? Does anybody have Margin Master? So that's maybe a third of you. And some of you I know have had it for too long and probably not doing enough with it, and that's okay. Some of you just like to come see me, and that's cool. Those of you that don't have Margin Master, the question I have to ask you is, have you been in one of my presentations before? Anybody, anybody been in one of my presentations but doesn't have Margin Master, you don't? So today's goal, you're walking out of here and I'm going to make you 2% on your bottom line. I don't even know what your bottom line is, but I'll make 2%. Okay? It's, th it's that easy. Is there anybody in the room, before we go that far, that would share an experience to have with Margin Master from when they just start, signed up? Anybody will do that? I didn't solicit the crowd. I don't know who's here. Anybody had it long enough to do that? I won't put anybody in that spot. Go ahead. I think in our first year we saw a same sales gain of like twenty-five thousand dollars just by using my that's two stores. So about, right. about twelve. About twelve grand a piece. Eight thousand square feet. Kind of found money. Yep. That's what we're talking about here. So so the reason that I'm I'm glad everybody's here this morning is I just want you to, to kind of open your eyes a little bit and pay attention to some of the things that are happening in pricing. It certainly started 10 years ago. It isn't getting any easier today. In fact, I tell you, it's getting a lot harder when we're talking about that. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today isn't margin mastery. It's pricing philosophy. It's, it's what's going on. And my absolute goal today is just to make you open your mind. I'm not here to sell you margin master. I hope that you find that a tool that might be useful to you. But if not, that's okay. What I really hope is, at the end of the day, you can go back to the store. I'll give you a couple little tidbits that I think you can just go back to the store. You might make a thousand bucks just by doing a couple little things I'm going to share with you. And if, that, if that's all that we get out of that, that's cool. I mean, you don't have to buy Margin Master. I would commit you to that. Something that is important is this is your meeting. I think we only have an hour of time. I've never given a meeting in an hour. I mean, that's crazy to me. I mean, three hours? We could, we could get started. Tom's laughing in the back. So we're going to squeak through some stuff. We're going to go really fast. So if you, if you see something you have a question about, don't hesitate to just interrupt me. And, and I'm just going to roll. So I think it's important that we start with some basics of what is the problem with retail today, and retail pricing today, really. And that is the consumer over the last 10, 15 years has really been changed. They've been changed by the likes of Walmart. They've been certainly changed by the internet. We, we all remember the big box and the way they changed it. Well, guess what? Their business model is changing too. If you haven't read the articles on what's happening in to Office Max and to, to Best Buy, these big box retailers are in big, big trouble because they've got these huge buildings and they can't support them. People can buy this stuff over the internet. If you need a pack of pens and you can have them delivered to your office the next day for no shipping, why would you drive to Office Max? And you're not, is the answer. 
So the same thing is true with everything that we sell. Customers have absolutely changed what they'll buy, where they're going to buy it, and how much they're going to pay. When they're standing in your store and they take out their phone and they're doing this, they're not texting their friend. They're checking the price of your Delta faucet against what the internet says it could be. And if you're wrong, not only do they not buy it from you, because that's, that's just a, that'd be an easy loss if that was all that happened, they don't come back. They're done in the hardware business. They're done coming to your hardware store unless one thing happens. And this is the cool part. If you're a good retailer and they come to you for a reason other than to buy a Delta faucet, in other words, my faucet's broken, I need a faucet. I've got a lot of places I could go. I could get online, I could drive to Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's, Walmart, everybody sells faucets. Everybody probably sells a lot of the same ones we carry. Why do I come to Brad's hardware store? Because when I walk in, my, my cashier at the front, morning Brad, how are you? Hey, thanks for inviting me to your son's graduation party. There's a relationship there. And there's good customer service. And when I say good customer service, this always scares me. Good customer service isn't helping somebody and smiling. All that stuff we've been told forever, that that's good customer service, that isn't anymore. It, that doesn't do it. It's going above and beyond that. It's, it's you got to see, because have you been to Home Depot lately? This is always fun. How many of you have been to Home Depot in the last 30 days? One, two, yeah, four of you. Why? You don't have Home Depot in your market, so it's Lowe's. You've all been in Lowe's in the last 30 days? Anybody been in Lowe's? A couple of you. See, now you guys are afraid I'm going to tease you. Why? Have you been in the Ace store down the street? Have you been, have you been in the, the other competition? Have you been in Walmart and seen what they're doing in spray paint? I mean, have you checked out what's going on in the Walmart paint department? It's pretty impressive. Now, they don't have anybody there that can mix paint for you or do anything for you. But, boy, it looks good. And, it, and it's cheap. If I'm just buying a can of spray paint, why wouldn't I go buy the same can of Krylon spray paint that I buy from all of our stores? Why wouldn't I buy it for a dollar and a half less? Because I'm already there buying my groceries. Most Americans are there something like twice a week, so why would I come to the stinking hardware store? If you think it's because of price, and you're playing a game, there's a few retailers in the country where maybe that's true, but in most of our businesses, that isn't the case. They're coming because they want to support the local business. They've done business with you for 50 years. Your friends are their friends, and you hang out at the barbecue together. That's why they're shopping in our stores. And if we lose that sight of what that is, it doesn't matter these things anymore because they can easily justify why they're going to go someplace else. So what I'm really saying is the biggest problem in retail isn't that the consumer's changed. It's that we refuse to change and most of us refuse to acknowledge that something better change. Does anybody remember 10 years ago uh, any other stores in your market that are no longer there? There are lots of them. They have closed up like crazy and I don't know the statistics exactly. But I know in my market, where my three stores are, I had 17 independent competitors that are all gone when Home Depot came to town and Super Walmart came to town. 17. That's not that. I'm in northern Michigan. That's about a 45 mile radius. 17 competitors gone. There's three left and one big box. They're, they're my three stores and Home Depot. And I'm not saying that I figured something out. Maybe I was in the right place, the right location. But I do think there's a reason that those other places failed, because I think that they could have survived. The reason that they didn't survive is because they refused to acknowledge that something was different. Guess what? It's not 1980 anymore, and because you pay $2 for something doesn't mean you sell for 4 The math of retail has changed. It's more complicated than that. And when I, I love it when I talk to a store and they say, well, we don't have the internet at our store. What? We don't have any competition. You don't. Like, you ever seen one of those big brown trucks that drive around with the UPS on the side? There's your competition. And I don't care if you live in the middle of Alaska, Federal Express will deliver to them, and they'll charge them a freight rate, and they don't have to leave their house to get the stuff that they can buy from you. So what does that mean to us? We better be adapting, and we better change, and we absolutely have to find a reason to motivate ourselves and get started. We're just too darn busy. How many of you spend more time cutting key blanks than making business decisions that are going to drive your business forward? I get it. We've got to cut keys right and you want to take care of our customer. But you know what? I can pay a high school kid to cut keys. I can't pay a high school kid to run my business and be the entrepreneur that we all are supposed to be. I get excited and start spitting up. I get you in the front. That's right. <laughs> you know, we all know the competition. We've all seen it. The internet is absolutely changing things. And I will be surprised in the coming years, Depot and Lowe's, they got trouble coming.
Why do you need a 150,000 square foot building to sell 60 or 70,000 products that 35,000 of those products are more expensive than $10? And they can buy any of those things online and have it shipped at their front door if you don't need it. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to have those buildings starting. It's maybe five years off. I'm just making a prediction. I don't know anything. But it's got to happen. If people aren't buying that stuff from those stores, they don't need those big buildings. It's going to get converted to something else. Maybe it's going to be one of those roller rinks from the floor. I think. Who knows what it's going to be? But we don't need these big In fact, what it might be, and this has happened in some places, it's going to be one of those new local Amazon warehouses where they ship the stuff to you and you get it the same day. They're doing that in Chicago now, if you haven't read some of those articles. So imagine, I need that Delta faucet and I like it. I'm standing at Brad's hardware store. He's $2 high. Click on my phone before I get home. The UPS guy's already got it loaded up and he's driving it to my house. That's what's coming. And we can we can put our blinders on and say, well, I live in a, a small town. That's never gonna happen. My hometown, 6,000 people with a Home Depot, Super Walmart. I don't care, it's gonna happen. They are gonna be hurt. The question is, where are, where are we gonna be? Are we gonna be ready to take, take advantage of the fact that other people can't do things? And we need to do that because we've got to figure out what our product use is. How many people sell a lot of power tools anymore? Remember when you used to order pallets and pallets of sawzalls and drills and all that stuff? And there was a lot of stuff. There are very few retailers that make a big business in power tools now because guess what? If you want a DeWalt power drill, you get online, you buy at the cheapest price. It's the same exact model number. I don't care. And when it breaks, this is the other change. It's disposable. So the old adage, well, they're going to bring it to me for service. Eh, I've had that five years. You should get another one. That's the mentality. How many of you the same with lawnmowers? Same with so much stuff. It's disposable. They don't care. The service doesn't mean anything. Something's disposable. Buy it cheap. I bought a pair of shoes yesterday. Kind of an interesting story. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, this is this is great. And I'm going to wear them out of the store. The gal says to me, well, you've got to take your box. I'm like, well, I don't want the box. I'm on a business trip. I don't, I don't need to carry the box. She said, well, you won't be able to return them if there's a problem. I'm like, they're a pair of shoes. I've got them on right now. What's going to be the problem? I understand there's some of you that probably would return them, maybe. But I'm wearing them. They're good. They are not now. They're really nice, but these aren't good. So how do we start? And where do we go? Obviously, this is the first step. We've got to educate ourselves. We've got to be aware of how do you educate yourself. If you're not paying attention to the trade publications, and you're not looking at the internet, and you're not listening to what's happening, do you look at Home Depot's uh, uh, annual report? Lowe's annual report? Have you seen them? You see the profit margins that they generate at the bottom line? Pay attention to what's going on there. Why can a Home Depot make 7% bottom line profit, roughly, over the last couple of years, and the typical hardware store is making 2%? We're the independents. We own our buildings. We're paying ourselves payroll. And we're making 2%. They're making 8 You know what? Sell your stuff. Buy stock in their company. That might be a better strategy. But the cool thing is this. I've worked with almost 2,000 stores. And those 2,000 stores make a lot of money. Not a lot, most of them. Making money in this business isn't that hard, but it requires the willingness to change. We've got to make an honest assessment of where we are. And just giving it the old glad hand, yep, I'm a good, we're good at customer service. Look how good we are. Our customers love us. Are you? Would you really put that to the test? Have you ever asked your customers? What do your customers think of your price? Do they buy from you because you're the only place they could get it at the last moment? It's like the Walmart in my town. I'll go there. If somebody's dying, I gotta go in. But I am not going there forever because I hate that place. They've destroyed the retail economy. I, I don't care about it. I'm not going there. If that's the perception somebody has in your store, you're not overcoming that. I don't care if you drop all your prices in half, you carry new stuff, they might not ever come back. We gotta abandon that. We gotta come up with a, a new decision of what is the go forward gonna look like. How are we gonna strategize? to get ourselves in the spot that we need to be. And I promise, in very rare cases, is it the same place we were 10 years ago? And that's the part that I think is the hardest part for people to digest. I get it all, I, this is my favorite thing with pricing, I know we're talking about pricing, so people will tell me, Brad, my dad has done pricing in that store for 50 years, and he's not changing anything. It's like, you know what, that business will die with them. If that business is going to the next generation, it's harsh to say. If the business is going to go to the next generation, something has to change. The profit model has to change. I have three sons. Why would my three sons want to come back to my conveniently three stores for 2% profit? They could get a job working at McDonald's, paying minimum wage, not have any of the headaches. I'm working six days of the week. I'm in early. I'm late.
late. You know, something's always happening. I mean, you know the routine. That's what we do. Why would a kid want to do that in the next generation when they're brought up with their texting and their cell phone and all that stuff? That's more important to them than the idea of working hard for an honest living. Honest living? Heck, how about easy living? I don't need much. That's the way they think. You've, you've tried hiring some of these kids lately. Have you had any good luck this spring getting some summer help? Oh, cow. My policy, hire three to get one. You know, hire three, two of them will make it to lunch. You know, this, the third one might make it a week. It is so sad to hire these kids today. They have no desire to be there. So we got to monitor the competition. we got to know what's going on. And when we're not even visiting people in those, I hate visiting home people in my own town because every time I'm in there, who do I see but my own customers? God, that's awful. You know, what are you doing at home people? Uh, this one, you, know, you know, you think that they're your best friends and they're shopping with you? They're not. They're down there too. So I hate going there. But when I'm here or I'm in some other town, I always go to stop at Depot Lowe's. And I'm taking pictures with my phone. Here's what their display looks like. Here's, oh, you know what? We sell that same stuff. Here's the pricing they've got on that. Have you seen the new assortment they got? What do they have at their front registers? They're just paying attention. Being a little bit innovative in how I'm paying attention. We can't do that if we aren't, if we're so busy cutting keys, we aren't going to go. We got to make the change, and of course, as we monitor what they're doing, we know what their strengths and weaknesses are. We then got to come up with a plan that says, "Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tailor my plan. I'm going to navigate the waters as things change. Maybe some of the decisions I make aren't right. This is entrepreneurial 101, and I'm going to make sure that I'm measuring success. Is it working or not? I don't just put in a new line of paint and say, "There, it's done," and then go on vacation. We we work with it and we mold it and we shape it. That's what we do. So why aren't we doing it? And the scary thing for most people is, oh, it's too, this take me forever. I don't have time for that. It's, uh, this is my favorite. It's spring now. We're too busy. Too busy. Too busy to make more money. Too busy doing what? Too busy working in your business versus on your business. We've all heard that saying. If we're too busy to get started with anything, this really is the problem. And maybe if you don't like to think of it in terms of the old eat, eat an elephant thing, I always like, I always think of it every morning. I look at my knee, this is going to ruin the rest of your life with your toothpaste. How many times do you open up a new tube of toothpaste and you're thinking, wow, look at that big tube of crest. I mean, that thing's huge. And next thing you know, you're squeezing, you're rolling that thing up. You remember squeezing all that stuff out of there? It's just little pieces at a time, but we're taking little steps, and eventually you get to the end. So whether it's eating an elephant, brushing your teeth, whatever it is, you've got to do something. And it's not acceptable any longer to do nothing. And there's a big motivator. My friend and yours, why wouldn't we be motivated to not only make our business successful and continue to support our communities, because our, our communities absolutely value what we do. They're, we're there not just as a, a piece of the community, but when the Little League and the Girl Scouts want to sell cookies and uh, the veterans are selling poppies out front, all those things that are going on as part of your business, you are part of that community. And if you fail because we don't do anything, we let them all down. Not to mention your employees, not to mention your family. We can do better if we're making money. Need a new sign? Takes money. Need more employees? Takes money. Need new training? Anything you need, we got to do it out of the profit dollars. If there's no profit dollars, our business starves and we eventually are out of, out of business. I'm, I'm kind of being uh, Debbie Downer. I'm sorry about that. There's a couple ways that we can affect bottom line profit. And this, if somebody has another one, I'd love to hear it because I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe we can add another level in here uh, called Miracle. There is a big Powerball thing this week. So that could be your strategy. Uh, that would be effective. The reality is that there's only three major ways we can affect bottom line profitability. We can increase top line sales to drive some additional profit dollars to the bottom. We could do that. Haven't we been working at that? I mean, haven't we kind of been fighting? We run the right, we do what we think is right with advertising. Maybe we could tweak that a little bit. But let's say you ran a really good advertising campaign, you drove sales another 5%. That 5% doesn't deliver 5% more profit. It delivers the same percentage of profit you're already working with. Okay? Another thing we could do is we could reduce expenses. <coughs> if you're like most of us where the economy hasn't been good, I realize there's parts of the country where the economy is going crazy. But in most places of the country where you've already trimmed, you've already, let, you've already cut your, your staffing back as low as you can go. You know, I go in stores sometimes, they got every order light bulb out in the aisles. I'm like, you know, what's up with that? Well, we trimmed our electric bill by half. I'm like, wow, we really are cutting expenses. Well, sure, I mean, that, that's what's happening. We can't trim expenses anymore. But one thing we can do, 
and I absolutely can show you store after store after store that's done it and done with success, and that is tweak their margins just this much. 1%, 2%. What would the impact be in your business if your pricing model did two things? Delivered 1% to 2% more bottom line profit. That's simple, sounds simple. But at the same time you did that, what if it made more sense? Any of you ever had your spray paint have all 24 colors of Kryolan? They're all $2.99 except for purple. It's $2.19. I don't know why. It's always purple. But whatever it is, there's something that's wrong. When you're looking at your, your speed board drill bits, the half inch, the three quarter, seven eight, they're all lined up nice in a row, but one of them's a dollar more than the rest. Next time you're in Walmart, stop and check and see how their spray paint looks. It is not priced wrong. And what does a customer think when they're looking at your store and they're standing at your assortment? They're like, wow, Brad doesn't have any real clue what's going on with spray paints, does he? They don't know what the price should be, by the way. But they know that all the colors should be the same. It's funny, I see all the heads nodding right there. Because we all do that. We're always putting out those fires. We can improve our margins, fix those types of problems, and make it happen pretty easy. The hardest part is we have to learn how we set retail prices and what drives retail pricing. And this is, this is kind of the hard part for some people to buy into. The old idea that the cost of goods has anything to do with what your retail price should be, let's get rid of that myth right now. Those days are dead and gone. There's not many things that you sell. Maybe pure commodities uh, that you're selling locally. Maybe a pure commodity that holds true. But for most hardware items particularly, the, retail, the cost of the item has no bearing on what the retail should be. The fact that you can't buy a gallon of Kiehl's paint correctly to compete with Depot and Lowe's selling at a $12.99, that's not the consumer's fault, that's your fault. Make a choice, either don't sell it or do something different, sell an alternative product. But you can't sell something that's a primary product that's in every weekend flyer and be $2 more a gallon. You just can't. It's inexcusable, and again, might as well hang the banner out front. We don't know what we're really doing here, so just come on in. And that's not a real successful banner that we're going to fly. Same thing with delivery costs. Same, same thing with all these. The cost of doing business, I don't care what your payroll is. I get if you're in California and you've got an expensive cost of doing business. That absolutely gets reflected, but guess what? Deep on those have expensive costs of doing business in those places as well. Of course, we think that the competition has something to do with it. The competition can certainly have an impact, but the big driver for retail pricing is this, and it's nothing more than this. And the only thing you have to affect to have a successful pricing model is this. So how do you do that? Well, if I'm deep on Lowe's uh, and Menards, I have a NASCAR, I run ads on every basketball game that you've ever seen, every football game, everything's out there. And what do they do? We have the lowest price. We have everything you need. We're the best retailer ever. We got good customer service. All they do is tell you what they want you to believe. Is it true? Anybody ever read prices that are lower than Home Depot? Absolutely we do. You think if you told your customer that they'd believe you? Not a chance. So the question is why are you less? Customers don't believe it because they're being bombarded 24-7 with a message from this huge advertising machine that says, we're better than everybody else, so you've got to do what we say. It doesn't make much sense. They do some other things to drive that. We'll hit on this real quick. All the big boxes, Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, they all have a low price guarantee. In fact, every major retailer today, every single one of them has a price match guarantee. They might exclude categories, they might do some different things. But here we are as the independent retailer. 95% of us don't match prices. In fact, we think our first thought is when somebody asks us to match a price, my customer's trying to rip me off. Are they? Because they're in your store. The guy that's ripping you off, I always, I always say this, and I think it's true. If they're going to rip you off, guess what? They put the circuit breaker in their pocket and they walk out. Your customer, a legitimate customer, which is the people that are shopping your store still, will say to you, Brad, I want to buy this coupler hammer circuit breaker, and you're $2 more than Home Depot. Is there anything you can do? Boy, I, I'm surprised I'm $2 more. I'm trying to be competitive with them every day. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. You know what? Let's just get, get it for you at that price. What have I just done? And that's, look, they got, that guy's going to go to the barbecue that weekend. He's going to be standing around the campfire cooking his hot dog. You know, I went to Brad's and bought that circuit breaker I've been looking for. Not only do they have it, they're friendly. I love everything about them. But you know, I thought their price might be a little online. They didn't even question me. They just matched it. 
If every single retailer's got one of these, and start paying attention, because I've got a little collection I have in my office of all the store's price match policies, they post them. You stand there, stand by the front door, walk in office max. There's their band, there's their sign. This is what we'll match, this is what we do. And yeah, you, you, can, you can get concerned about it. It's kind of fun when you look at them. This is, this is Walmart's. You've heard the new ad match thing where any competitor's ad they'll honor? Anybody's. But this is the fine print. Well, if this, if this, if this, if this, then if this, and if you get down here, and of course, oh, if it's a going out of business or a percentage off, they've got a thousand exclusions, but it's the perception, remember. We match anybody's price, that's what we do, la la la, then we'll try and do it. Well, except for in that case, we don't match those. Sure, it's gotta be like items or the same item. And you can you can tailor your policy to whatever you want, but I would absolutely tell you from a perception standpoint, if you don't have a price match guarantee, get one. <coughs> Get one in place, get a banner out front, put it on your receipts, we match prices. You know, and when somebody asks you, it's not hassle them, it's not give them a hard time. Yes, I understand the guy's gonna say, hey, I could buy that $300 grill for $79. It's probably not the same thing. So we have, we have to have some catch-alls as well. We gotta have people that are educated, gonna do a little checking if it's obvious. True story in my store, customers in, I'm standing in one aisle, I don't know what I'm doing there. In the next aisle over, I hear a new sales associate helping somebody, they're looking for shoe goo. It's hanging there on the peg. <coughs> yep, here it is, it's $5.99. And I hear the customer say, oh, well that's only $3.99. My, my, the new person is like, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. The person <coughs> says, walk out. And of course, I'm, after they pick me up from the floor, because I'm dead, we didn't train this person properly, obviously, but they're new, so I give them, I jump around the aisle, I say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. They're $2 less than that? No problem, we'll match that. Immediately, no questions, no anything. We call Home Depot, that was their price, they were $2 less. So now I have a choice to make. Do I want to adjust my pricing, or do I just want to live with the fact that I spent $2 on advertising to match a price for them? Because that's really what it was. Go ahead. Do you have a, do you have a sense of, I guess I feel like there's not a lot of people who actually take advantage of this price measure. So I think it's something that you feel that you can promote and it probably doesn't hurt you that much. And your this is, uh, the description you just described, if somebody's talking in the aisle, that's where you pick up on it because a lot of times they're not going to approach and That's right, they won't say anything. And, and that's when you make it even more successful when you say, when you open your you say, I'll take care of it. So, so I would tell you that I've been preaching this for a couple years. And people that have done it come to me a year later and they like to show me, here's the banner that we have made up, or Two of Us has a fantastic kit for low price match guarantee. They have it all together. It has the signs in it, it has everything in it. Just ask for it. It's called the price match kit, I think. It's something clever. Yes? So how would you handle when the customer said, two weeks ago I purchased this and now it's like what's your, what's your policy? Well, it's, it's great. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah, and that's, and that's a big, that's a good, what's their policy with appliances? Because if they bought it from Depot, and then it came up within 30 days, they're matching. Maybe it's 15 days on appliances, I don't know. But I would absolutely have something comparable, and I would always have a piece of paper to fall back on. But let's just say that the person came and said, hey, appliances are a kid, they're, they're an outlier, they're maybe something special. But it's a hammer, and it's a $2, $2 off of a $20 hammer. For $2, I'm willing to lose a customer, even if they're being a little dishonest and they're not sure what Home Depot is for $2, how much do we spend on advertising every month? If it happened 10 times a month, that $20, if it was $100 a month, it's almost not. And that's true, that's what I So that, that fine print and everybody thinks is, look, it has to be the same item and we reserve the right to check it. Not a bigger ticket item. My policy is, my employees, every one of them, could make, it, make an adjustment down to cost. They can't go to low cost without a manager approval. So if somebody were to say, again, we don't sell appliances, so I, I don't know what I do there. But if they're buying a hammer and somebody wants it for $10, we're selling them for $16, is it above cost? Because we're not going to spend an hour trying to get on Home Depot's website and figure it out and hold this person up and we'll call you back and we'll send you a check and stop back tomorrow. They aren't doing it. They're just not coming back. They're not shopping with you anymore. It's not worth the few dollars to ask for. Yes. Uh, you're probably aware of it, but the Depot and Lowe's, their smartphone apps, you can either scan the barcode uh, or you can save it to the microphone and the items pop up with yep. their price and their formula. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So you can tell if you even have it. It's pretty cool. And, and, so you can tell right away. And you, should be, and you better be using those things in your store because your customers are. But again, I want to buy.
buy this $2 switch plate cover for a dollar less than what you're selling for. Okay, hey, thanks. I, it's just, oh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. We make sure we record the fact that we've had to match a price. And then we make a decision in the back room, do I have an issue with my pricing on Chugu? Or, you know, I look at my sales agent, well, we sold 24 of them last year at the full price. You know what, I'm going to let it go. Because that person, guess what, is probably never buying Chugu again, or it's going to be years until they do. But they're coming back to me when they do. You spend more time analyzing it than it costs you that. That's right. And I, and, and I don't like to get hung up on it. I like to always think of that as advertising costs. All right, we're getting sidetracked there, and I'm almost out of time. Holy cow. Anybody know the one up there? If you've been in a presentation, well, who doesn't have a price match guarantee up there? Amazon. Amazon blatantly tells you, we will not match prices, don't ask us. You know why? Because if you want it, you click buy. If you don't want it, don't buy it. But they won't match prices. I don't blame them. They don't have to. Because they don't have a storefront. Full price guarantee. So the reality of pricing is this. The, the actual prices are far less significant than what the perception is. If somebody perceives you as being higher, which I hate to break it to you, every one of your customers thinks you're more expensive. They already do. You have to be. You're the little guy. You don't have a NASCAR. Oh, I'd like to have a, I had a NASCAR. I wonder what I call it. Brad's race team. Maybe be cool. And think what I can advertise in my local market. I could put the car out front in the parking lot. People would stop by all day long and want to buy it. And guess what? They still think I'll be more cheap. They are a machine. And our, our little advertising budgets in comparison to theirs, we aren't going to change that. But what we can do is win over and over, and we can absolutely know that individual prices are not what creates the perception. Just because I'm higher on an item, that's what they expect. So why not be there? Perceptions created from these other things that we all suppose we're great at. We have the right store appearance. We, we're there at the right hours. Our staff is friendly. They're well-trained. Yeah, right. Guess what? I come to a lot of your stores. There are some scary operations out there. Stores that when I go to, as an educated, hardware consumer, you got to leave and you got to say, ooh, good luck there. That's sad. And if your business is one of those, the only thing you can do is say, you know what? we got to get better. And the reality is being good just isn't good enough. You've got to be better. And we can. There's, there's hundreds, thousands of examples, tens of thousands of examples of stores that are making good money because they're making profit. It's why we're here. Sometimes we get lost in the idea that what we're really here for, but we're here to make profit. It's not a bad thing. Profit is good. We do good things with profit. Okay? And the trick is to maximize profitability. We've got to find a way to find that sweet spot. The customer perceives that we're higher already. So let's be a little bit higher, but let's not ever be so high that they get offended and quit coming to us, right? I mean, if they do that, they're obviously are losing the battle. But when they come in to buy something, there are some items that we got to be exactly the same price as what the big box is or what it is on the internet, but there are also an awful lot of items that we sell that really doesn't matter if you're double that price. You tell me that the price of an O-ring is important to a consumer? I just need one O-ring. You know, you're selling at nine cents. For what? If it's a dollar, who cares? You're the only place that sells them. They can go to the, the plumbing wholesaler or something. Things less than $10, guess what? If they're within 30% of a Home Depot price, nobody is walking out of your store very often for something that's, that's too out of line. You're $1.99 instead of $1.49. <gasps> they don't care. They came to you because, remember, they have that relationship. They knew you were more. The 50 cents to them saved them the hassle of having to go out there, park a half a mile away, walk in, get pointed two or three times, find the thing, find the, oh, I'm not sure that's, oh, no, i got to go to the other end of the store, then go up front and do the self-checkout probably. I mean, that, that's a good indicator of how well these people are at marketing themselves. Not only do we want you to come in, we're going to give you a little prices, but we want you to check yourselves out. We aren't loading it up for you. We aren't going to talk to you. We don't want to do anything. Just you're on your own. It sounds like internet shopping. Boy, are they dumb. Let's just teach our people how to use the technology to get what they want and load it in the car themselves. What a bad, bad experience. By the way, when you go out to a restaurant, and you go to a really nice restaurant, oh, well, you guys just seat yourselves, and then you go back in the kitchen, you make it yourselves, and when you're done, clean your dishes, however you want, that's fine. I mean, that's not going to work. People pay for quality, and they want it. Yes? What's the measure of price that you think 
we have pretty much free range to mess with them, argue with them, they never will turn around the line. There, there was a study done that's probably a little bit aged, and this is maybe five to seven years ago. I don't know if there's been anything done recently, but of asking consumers what they perceive. And the results of that were something like 17% was, was the average number. But you've got to keep in mind each business is a little different. So a typical hardware store, hardware store only, not a lumber yard, typical hardware store, 60% of their gross profit dollars come from items that are $10 and less. So if it's an item that's $10 or less, I tell you the number is 25, 30%. $5 or less, it's maybe even more than that. Okay? Because again, that 99 cent item, whether I'm 99 cents or $1.99, I could be 100% more, it's just not a big deal. But on a Weber barbecue grill, try and be $5 more. You can't. You know, and that, that Delta faucet you've been talking about, you can't. Those are things that, that if it has, and a good rule of thumb, if it has a serial number, if it's a name brand, if those types of things, the price is set. And it's not set by you, you follow the lead. But if it's a generic, I need a faucet stem. Anybody look at your faucet stem prices, by the way, lady? I mean, they're scary. Why would you buy a new faucet stem when you buy the whole faucet for less? That's a little bit scary. Don't sell any faucet stems anymore. Why not? Because they're $15 and the faucet's $29. I'll just buy a new faucet. The chrome on this one's been worn off anyways. Disposable. So I don't know if that answers that question. I think, I think it varies with price. It's certainly higher at the lower end. And it, the more expensive you get, the more spot on you got to be. So where do prices come from for you? In, in reality, most stores don't even know where the retail prices come from. We did something on IMCS 10 years ago. We signed up for something. I told them I wanted this, but I'm not sure what that even was. They come on the truck, they send them to me. Well, guess what? That's not necessarily fair. And it's certainly not a quality way to run your business. If you were running a Walgreens, You'd be fired for running your business that way. You need to have a finger on the pulse of your business and know what's going on. And pricing is number one in retailing. That's the thing that retailers do is set retail prices so they can make profit. If we don't know where they come from, the red flag should go up. And let's make that phone call first and find out where they come from. Where are they set today? What are they? How many items do you have that you're selling now below good best retail? Why do you have items that you're selling below good best retail? Do you have any items that you're selling above, above good best retail more than 10%? We need to know these things. What categories do you have that you think are competitive in your store? I can't tell you that. Do it best can't tell you that. The only person that knows that is you. Okay, so who's doing that work? Well, they came on the truck. Again, and again, and again, and again. I got more stickers. Do those price stickers. Okay, we got all the stickers done. Fantastic, we're working on stuff that's just silly. Let's be a little bit educated. What's your pricing image? You ever ask your customers? What do they think? What, do you, you know, what is a contract you think? You know, what do you think of my place? You could certainly pull aside some of your good longtime customers and say, you know, we're, we, we went to this thing at the Do It Best Market and this guy was telling us that we don't know anything, so just give me a little feedback. What do you think of our pricing? I know what you're going to hear, and so do you probably. But talk to them. Let them tell you. Guess what happens when you have that dialogue? Well, who cares what I think? He's paying attention. I wonder, I wonder if he would also put in that other line of this, the, I need this five gallon pail of floor stripper. I wonder if he can get that. There's a dialogue, there's a relationship. All of a sudden, all those things that make us so important come out of just trying to figure out what are we doing right. And if they came to you and said, hey, you're great on everything, but your light bulb pricing stinks. Really? What's wrong with it? Where do you buy your light bulbs today? Do I have the right mix? I'm just too high? You'd rather have a different brand? What's the deal? Let's learn. Yes? Sure, there's a program where there's some type of shopping or customer survey. Absolutely do that. I mean, you can know, spend a couple hundred bucks to get a survey done, whatever it costs. It is so valuable and such an eye-opener for most of us, particularly if we don't know the answer to question one. 
And of course, are we a good retailer? Maybe you're not the right ones to answer that for your own business. Maybe, you, maybe you've got a retailer friend that's down the street or in the next town over and you're willing to swap stories and be honest with each other. Say, come to my store on Saturday afternoon at 10 in the morning and tell me, am I getting it done right or not? And if they're lined up 60 deep at the registers and they're not getting help down the aisles, we're not getting it done. It doesn't mean sales can be fantastic, profits can be fantastic, but those things don't continue forever. And of course, does our pricing model work? Uh, and then how do I measure if I'm being effective with my pricing? Well, being effective with pricing is certainly not as easy as I'm, I'm still in business another year. And that means nothing. I mean, look at, look at some of the stores that have continued to ride the fact that they've got really poor retail practices for a long, long time. Eventually, it catches up. But the fact that a retail business is in, is in existence and they are in, they're living in a building that was paid for 150 years ago and the owner works there 80 hours a week, that business truly isn't making it. And that's a hard assessment to make. The way I like to think of, of is your business making or not is, is very simple. Something happens tomorrow, I gotta sell my store. What's it worth? Is it worth what the inventory is? Is it worth, is it worth anybody even coming to see what it is? Or is it just liquidation value? I get 50, 60 cents on the dollar, maybe. Maybe I can pass off some of those old fixtures somewhere. My dumpy building, really, they should just bulldoze it. That business needs some rejuvenation. That's how you know if I'm, if I'm effective. If the other hand is, if I put a for sale sign up today, and there's three people around that say, hey, when that one comes up for sale, I'd be interested. You got something going. It might not be perfect, but it's at least on the right path. There's two different extremes there. Just because you're in business doesn't make you mean you're on the right path. Of success. So we got to measure it, we got to know. And, and this is hard. Everybody's heard this saying keep doing what you've always done, keep getting what you've always got. I put this up in every presentation for 10 years. So many people continue to do the same thing we've always done, blah, blah, blah. My dad taught me this way, my grandpa taught him. That's the way we do it. The truck comes on Tuesday, we order on this day. It's the same. Shake it up. Why are we so afraid? Because guess what? People in Lowe's and Menards and the internet are shaking it up. The, pro I'm sorry, the product mix is not the same. The things that you sell today are not the same. If your aisles haven't been reset in 10 years, you need to reset them. You need to drop some lines. You need to add a new line. You need to think about some new, uh, new appearance things. You need to do something that's more exciting than just the same old stuff we've always done. And I think that's, that's easy to preach to a crowd like this because you at least care enough to come to the market. The ones that I really worry about are the ones that have never been to a market. Where are they? What's the big deal? Two big deals. Holy smokes. Okay. Two big deals. Yes, there are. Yep. So where does Margin Master fit? How does Margin Master help? We're going to spend 15 minutes on Margin Master. Okay. I need more time. I get so excited. Where does Margin Master fit? Here's what Margin Master is. Margin Master is simply a tool to let you look at your pricing in comparison to some known things. And it lets you play some what-if games. And it lets you start to answer that question of, what is my pricing today? It doesn't tell you whether it's good or bad. It tells you what isn't. And based on the results I get back from what is my pricing, what does it look like from a profitability model, how does that deliver as far as my goal of, I want to make this much money on the bottom line, I want to have my customers think that I'm priced reasonably, I don't, you know, what are those goals you have? That's all Margin Master, it's just a tool. It's no different than you use your iPhone to make phone calls, or you use an Excel spreadsheet to look at data in different ways, you use your point of sale system to keep track of how Margin Master is just a way to look at pricing. It's, an, it's a different way. Is it a silver bullet? Does it do anything magical? Honestly, I'd tell you no. It's, it's just a clear and concise way that retailers can understand I'm looking at my pricing and I'm understanding the different ways that we're going to dissect it. So how do we do that? I'm going to jump in here. I don't spill my coffee. So when we jump into Margin Master, jump into Margin Master, Margin Master works very simply. Works very simply. Whether you have a point of sale system or not, no longer relevant. So stores that don't have a point of sale system at all, 
doesn't matter. You can still control your pricing and manipulate prices within Margin Master. We don't have time to go into that now. But the way Margin Master works is it puts in front of you a dashboard that says, here's all the information we know about your stuff. It's all the items if you have a point of sale system from your point of sale system. If you don't have a point of sale system, it's everything that's in your two year purchase history. From that information, we can, we can very quickly find some interesting numbers. One of those interesting things that I like to look at is, uh, if I can see here, I didn't take my glasses off, I'm too old, is what we call the, the one click statistics, or it's an overview screen. And it just simply takes every single item I sell, and this is actually two of best stores. I won't reveal the store numbers, store one and two, but this is live. This came in just about uh, last week sometime, I think. So these are, these are real numbers. I haven't uh, altered them in any way. This is their numbers. And it shows me here, now we've excluded items that they haven't sold any of in 12 months by default. You can see them if you care. But what's interesting when you're looking at your store is where are my prices? And you can see here, this store has 308, this is two stores. But across these two stores, they have 389 items that are priced below doing best suggested retail. That's not bad. I tell you, I see stores that will have 60% of their items below doing best retail. That's more common. So this store, I don't know the store, I don't even know whose store this is. They have 9,043% of their items are equal to doing best retail. They're, so, they're following some type of pricing program. I'm guessing that they don't have any idea what those 389 items are. They don't know why they're less than doing best retail. Somewhere years ago, they decided they need to be more competitive. But more interestingly than that, is they've got these other categories of what some new retails are, level one and level two retail, which are meant to be increments above doing best suggested retail. So if you're not looking to be competitive, you don't have a real difficult market, you can step to level one or level two, which are increments above, and they're roughly 3% steps. They're just increments above, I'm not going to go into the details. But you can see here that this store has 37% of the items that are at that level one price. They've done something with Margin Master. I don't know who that is, Calvin. They, they've had Margin Master, right? Okay. So, so you see some pretty interesting things. If we're doing this with your store, and you're seeing your numbers, we now start to get a picture of where is my pricing? It's not saying it's right, it's not saying it's wrong, it's wrong. These 389 items less than do it best retail. Maybe those are things that they made a conscious decision and said, you know what, I want to be less than do it best retail here because of this factor. Fair enough. I have no problem with that. I just want to make sure we know why they're less than do it best retail. How many items do we have that are greater than do it best level two? How many do we have that are greater than home people? How many do we have that are less than home people? What other things do we know? All that's available and all of that works in any category, subcategory, fine line that you're used to working with, if you want to see the subsets of SKUs just within a department, it's what your department is. It doesn't matter if it's a do it best department or not, it's your department. It doesn't matter if it's a do it best SKU, it's every item you sell. Where, where is the price today? What does the margin look like for that item? Another, another important number that I think is maybe even more telling than the, than the one click statistics screen that shows where are the prices, how many items do I have that are greater than, less than, is what we call the one-click statistics screen. This will take a little second for two stores. But what this screen shows us is what we call a city margin. And the city margin is this. One customer walks into your store today and says, Brad, I'll take everything that you've, that you've sold over the last 12 months. I don't care about the stuff you got on your shelf that you haven't sold in a year, but everything that you've sold in the last 12 months, and I'm going to pay you full retail. Okay? So we're going to ring up one transaction at the register, Everything I sold in the last 12 months, and, and of that stuff, we're going to assume that we're going to use the current replacement cost. So in this store, if that were to happen, the margin generated from that single transaction is 39 and a quarter percent. Right, wrong, and different doesn't. I don't care. That's not the point. The point is from 39 percent margin, okay, which is their hypothetical infinity as far as profitability goes. They're never going to get there. They're always going to have discounts, contractor discounts, promotions, things like that. So they're going to come down from this. In fact, if you knew you had a 3% promotion discount, you knew that you had 1% shrink, as you start backing those things out, you come back to a number then that says, you know what, we've got 30% to work with to operate this business. Well, okay, my payroll is 20%. My rent factor is 8%. I'm down to 2%. Guess what? I want to take a bonus at the end of the year. I made zero. You can very quickly see, but here's the cool way that works in reverse. If I take that number, again, that the hypothetical, everything sells today, one transaction, and I increase that margin 1%, where does that one margin fall 
in my financial calculations. Straight to the bottom line. Now let's think about a 1% change across in this store, I think it's 16,000 items per store. 1% change on those items, some items at some it's 29 cents, the more expensive things we're maybe not doing anything. That 1% change means the world of difference to the bottom line of the business. To the customer, it's, it's not perceptible. They don't know what happens. They can't. 1% might be from $1.29 to $1.40. That's 20%. Nobody cares. That's what we're talking about. So when margin mash are the way that we get there, and again, I don't have time, is if we did something simple. And we said, look, just show me all the items in this store, those items that, are, that were less than doing best retail. I take my glass off. I'm sorry. If we want to see all those items that are less than doing best retail, now keep, keep remember that before we were looking at all the items that had some type of sales. In this case, we said show us all the items regardless if they have sales or not. So there's 820 of them, and I can verify that because I see the information. Here's do it best suggested retail. I can see it is crackle ice light must be one of those four two by four panels. I can see what the price is for for the cost. I can see what my current retail is. I'm six dollars and twenty nine cents. Well, do it best says I could be six dollars and forty nine cents. So, are we going to make the argument that if I went to six dollars and forty nine cents instead of six dollars and twenty nine cents, somebody's going to walk out of my store and not buy that? No. The reality is, every time I sell one, I'm going to I'm going to make twenty cents more. Well, the cool thing is, we also know that we sold one of those over the last year. So, if I just made that one change, I'm going to make twenty cents more. Woo! -hoo. But what's more powerful than that is, if I were to take all these items that are less than doing best retail. Just turn this off for a second. And in fact, say, what would happen if I had sold those at Bootless Retail instead of the retails I'm at today? So it takes, again, just 800 items. It sets my future price column here to the Bootless Retail. So you see 1649, I'll get rounding and turned on, so I didn't click that right. Did I click that? So it's going to go through and it's going to apply them. And with rounding, it's going to then apply, it's going to tell me if I did just that on those 800, I'd make $11,000. Now, again, this is unfiltered data. There's certainly some more multiple issues. There's some other things in here. The point isn't to have accurate numbers for this. The point is to show you the concept of looking at different subsets of items. If we do simple things, so let's just say we take the items that are in store, uh, store one, departments 10 and 15. I don't know how many items that is. Yeah, this is their department. That's not enough. 100, 128 items. We want more items in there. Okay, so there's 1,600 items in those four departments. If I didn't do anything to these, I didn't say, look, I don't care where they are today, but I just want to apply some rounding logic. Margin Master has an infinite number of rounding schemes that you can build. It has four of them that are built in, including it has, has the do it best default rounding scheme, but it also has some incrementally aggressive rounding schemes. So when I talk about an aggressive rounding scheme, uh, a rounding scheme to me means something different than what it does to a lot of people. Rounding in the old days was we go to the next nine and we round it off. We get really clever, maybe it's fives and nines or something really scientific. Modern rounding today means not only are we going to round to the right of the decimal, we're going to round to the left of the decimal, we're going to round up, we're going to round down, we're going to do all kinds of different factors. In fact, it's five level rounding in Margin Master that you can apply to different categories of items because you just think it makes sense. If we do that though and we choose a relatively aggressive rounding scheme, not, not getting too crazy. In fact, let's choose uh, AF1, and let's just take these, these 1,600 items, and let's set them to what their price is today. So we're not going to change their price, but we're going to enforce rounding. So in other words, whatever my price is today, apply it to that rounding table. Okay, so we didn't change any prices, we just changed rounding. If I did that on these items, I'd pick up $822 in additional profit. Now, what did I do that's crazy? I could go through all these and I could sort this and filter it. And I could see, look, this was $69.99, it's still $69.99. This was $279. Whoop, we took it to $299. How many items do you sell that are $2.99? Or $2.49 that could be $2.59? What are those things? Oh, I don't know. How many items do I have that have a retail price uh, that's equal to, let me get there, let's say. $2.49. In these two stores, I can tell you exactly how many items they have that are at $2.49. They have 655 items that are $2.49. But if we looked at the ones that are $2.39, well, 
possible for some. There's 13 of them. If those 13 went up 10 cents and I sold 100 of them, it's a couple bucks. That's the way the game works. So then the thing that Margin Master lets you do, Margin Master lets you build what we call a pricing strategy. And a pricing strategy, I'm not going to do it in there, I don't have time, I'll hang out afterwards if anyone wants to see. Here's what a pricing strategy is. Take your legal pad out, stand in, in each aisle of the store, or each department, or maybe start in the office, but write down a list of where does our pricing come from and what rules do we want to enforce for our pricing. So in other words, in my paint department, I want to be a new best retail. Fair, fair enough. In my tool department, I'm going to be a little bit more than do a best retail. I want to be a new best retail. I'm going to go to level one in my tool department. But on my speed board drill bits, those are really competitive to me, so I'm going to do a best retail less 25%. Fair enough. All right, we're just writing these down. That's all we're doing. Go to my electrical part. What do I want to do? What, do I, what am I doing in stove pipe? What am I doing from the stuff I get from uh, Forney, my welding supplies? What am I doing with all these different categories of items? How do I want to price them? Not how are they priced, how do I want to price them? And I'm doing that with some logic because everything I'm doing, I'm going through Margin Master, I'm seeing where is it today? What would happen if I did what I'm proposing? Do I like that, yes or no? And once I'm done, I've got a set of rules then, which collectively Margin Master are a pricing strategy. It's a list of rules that define a price for every item that we sell. Again, whether it's do the best item or not, doesn't matter. How do you want to price it? If we then know that, and we go forward, we go forward and the computer, and the computer knows how we want to price things, guess what happens? Pricing gets real easy, doesn't it? If the computer knows that my paint department items are all supposed to be priced at do the best retail, and I come to the market and I order five new paint items, what price do you think they should be at? Do the best retail. That's my rule. Now, if I decide I don't like that, I change my rule. But everything is driven by rules down to the skew level. It's, it's certainly fair to say that this one item, I want to always be this price, or I always want to be at a 10% margin. I want this skew to be the same. I mean, I mean we're talking about the tip of the iceberg right now. There are not many things that you can dream up that you want to make from a rules perspective that can't be done. Rules absolutely change. Rules are a, a living, breathing thing. So if you made your list of rules today, in most stores when they start off, the rules are relatively simple. Hey, let's go to do a best retail, and let's maybe take a list of blind classes, and we're going to bump those up, or we're going to do some stuff, we're going to go to the competition and see what we think, we're going to talk to our customers. Let's change the rules. The rules can change any time, and as the rules change, the goal is not to affect individual items, but to affect bigger categories. So be it a vendor, be it a department, class, fine line, whatever that category is, we want to affect the biggest group we can. Rules can always change. Rules work in a hierarchy of order. So I could have one rule, everything in my store goes to do best retail. Fine, I'm done. I've got a complete pricing strategy, every item's got a price. Done. Tomorrow you're going to come say, yeah, but I forgot to tell you that on our sandpaper we do this. Great. Let's make a new rule for sandpaper. We add it on the list. Oh, but that's right. That 80 grit stuff, we're, you know, we sell that. They got the warehouse down the street. We sell that stuff. Okay, great. Where are we going to do that? We build a list of rules to be complete to a point that you, you like what's happening. And when that happens then, pricing <coughs> makes a big shift. And again, not that the rules don't change. But implementing the pricing strategy gets very simple because guess who that doesn't involve? It doesn't necessarily have to involve the person who's making the pricing decision. If I tell you this is the prices I want you to put up, anybody can run the process, anybody can print the stickers off, anybody can enforce the fact that we take them off the shelf. And here's the typical process, and I'll, I'll kind of end on this. Typical story, we sign them up, we look at their statistics screen, we look at their summary numbers, and we ask them. How, you know, how has that been working for you? And they're like, well, we, you know, we've got a mess. We don't, we don't really know what's going on. We got that spray paint thing going on. We got all kinds of. What if we did these couple three things? And we just can kind of guide you through. If you just got to do the best retail, it's kind of a baseline. And if you just did this, and maybe you took some of those things that are 70% above the best retail, maybe they're too high. Let's bring some of those down. Let's raise some. It's not all about raising prices. Let's raise some. Let's lower some. Let's create a real streamlined strategy. At the end of that call, there's a number at the bottom of the screen that shows. Here's, here's what would happen if we implemented these price changes today. And I tell you, for most stores, that's between six and 10,000 items that would need to change. Typically, it's two-thirds up, one-third down. Again, just talking about what we see. 
Doesn't mean you'll be that way. But when you see that, so we're gonna raise, we're gonna raise six thousand, we're gonna lower three thousand. Great. At the end of doing that, when the customers are coming in there and they're buying stuff, in addition to seeing on that next day's sales report that you made a higher margin, the other thing happens is you get confirmation from the customer that they didn't see anything. They don't care. They're still buying stuff. In fact, you could put a sign out that says, look at our new lower prices. That's what Lowe's did. Look at our new lower prices. We lowered all our prices because we, we care about you. Yeah, sure, we lowered some, but we raised a lot more. Depot pioneered that, you know. I'm sorry, Lowe's pioneered that, but they're, they're a promise pledge, you know, or they were on TV left and right. We, we hear you, the economy's so bad, we're going to lower our prices because we feel bad for you. Baloney. The sign says, when you monitor, where we're monitoring their prices, says they actually raised way more than they ever decreased. They did decrease some, to be fair. But so what? They decreased some every day. They just are increasing more than they're decreasing. So how do we go forward? And how do we get, get to that next level with no time? We need to start somewhere. We need to start with that education piece. We need to know where your pricing comes from today. You need to know. I don't, I don't need to know. I'd like to show you. We need to know where it is today. We need to come up with a plan. Hey, I get it. Spring right now, we're busy. We're, we're scrambling just to get goods out on the shelf right now. That's a hard time. But if the profit was a big enough impact to the bottom line, so in other words, we were looking to add that 2% to the bottom line, maybe 3% to the bottom line, we could wait till Christmas to get that 3%. Or I tell you, you know what, this is an important enough decision in this business that somebody better put in some extra hours. Maybe we're even going to pay some overtime hours. We're going to bring our staff in, and we're going to re-sticker the store, we're going to rechange change those 5000 whatever it takes to get our pricing in line because we're in the selling season right now. We are not going to sell any more items at the wrong price. We're going to fix them. It's some work. Let's say you had to invest five grand. It would be a huge problem. You could, you could re-sticker an entire store for $5,000. For $5,000, we're going to restock the entire store. But the payback in 12 months is $20,000. Would you make that investment? I think most people would. The problem is this. I know that won't happen. I've shown people over and over and over again. We go through those numbers and say, look, you just brought these things into investment retail. And he does. It's, it's never been below 1%. I tell you, it's almost always 2% that we see. And here's the reaction I get from a lot of retailers. Oh. You're going to add 25 to 30, you're going to have 50,000 dollars done there with the numbers. 2% to my bottom line. That's great. Well, we'll think about it. I'm like, what? 50 grand? 10, 5 grand. I'm going to give you 5,000 dollars. We're too busy. I mean, I am blown away by the willingness to just say, well, we're too busy. We're too busy to make more money. This is what we do, folks. It's time to get something going. It's time to value where we are. So how much is it? The magic question. Really, this is this is almost criminal. I'm do it best to beat me up on this bad. That's good. There's a one-time installation fee of $125 for Margin Master. I know. It's, it's steep. $70 a month if you're a single store. That's it. There's nothing more. Now here's here's the bonus that comes with that. With us, there's no long-term contracts, there's no you know, we're not like the, the cell phone service where you sign on something and you're giving up your firstborn. It's not that. Uh, we make you happy. Our support desk, anybody that's used Margin Master would be happy to stand up, I know, and just tell you. Ask about the support you get. You know, they're great. And, and our goal is to be great. It's unlimited support, unlimited training. There's never a time you say, I don't remember how to do that. Okay, we'll show you again. It's not a problem. We have almost 2,000 customers. We lose some, some of, them, some of them don't use it, some of them for whatever reason. I can't, I can't, the old need a horse to water thing is certainly in play. I can show you the money, I can show you how to fix it, but I can't make you do it. And no hard feelings, I get that too, that's okay. Cancel any time, if you've got a multiple stores, each additional store, I think that's wrong, it's $25. $25 for each additional store? Yeah. Who put that slide together? That's wrong. Calvin. Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> And here's, here's a better deal for today that you don't get to take advantage of because you bought it in 30 days and no, you absolutely do. You give me a business card today before you walk out of the room, I'm going to pay the $125 installation fee. Okay? I want everybody to sign up. And here's the better deal. You give me your business card, whether we go through the demo and you get to the end of the demo and you say, Brad, that sucks, I don't want to do it. No problem. No, there's no charge. So here's the risk. <coughs> Zero. There's no risk. 
I haven't been approved to give that $125 away, but I'm doing it. Well, I have a question. I'm under the impression that as of 2014, you have to go with margin access or you can do a business agreement away with the IMCS funds. So, are you going to Yeah, you're correct. Right. So, yeah, no. So, so, the end of 2013, IMCS is certainly changing. Kelly, maybe you give us just a well, I just clarify that a little bit. You are correct. January 1, 2014, IMCS does go away. So where Do It Best manages your retails, that will cease to exist. Um, and, you know, printing price change reports and price change tickets and sending those to you in the mail, that all goes away. The IMCS reports go away. So, but we are offering alternatives, and Margin Master is a tool that you can use to manage your retail pricing. There are, you know, there are other options out there for you to do that. Um, so that option is available. We also have the Inventory and Pricing Dashboard, which is an online reporting tool which uses transactional data instead of purchase history. It's a great tool for you to look at. So you are correct in your statement. So you need to make a decision on how you're going to manage your retail pricing prior to January 1. So um, you know, this is, is, is our recommended option. This is why Brad is here. Um, Do It Best has evaluated and looked at it and has formed this agreement with Brad and retailer stock. So absolutely. I, I know everybody's got maybe other sessions they're trying to get to, so I don't want to Anybody up. If anybody's got to go, that's cool. Anybody that wants to stay in talk, I'll stay. I don't have another session until 